Hey everyone, uh, Jerry here from Llama Index, and in this video, we'll teach you how to build query pipelines over structured or tabular data. So when we try to build for the use case of question answering over tabular data, the tabular QA stack looks quite different from the traditional RAG stack, which is primarily over unstructured data. RAG typically looks like you have an input query, and then you do top K retrieval of text chunks from a vector database. You take those text chunks and you stuff it into the prompt to do response synthesis. Now, there's been a few stacks that have emerged for querying over tabular data, and they typically take the form of either pandas data frames or as a SQL database or a SQL database collection. And so in those settings, let's say for a pandas data frame, um, we call this text to pandas, but typically, you know, you would take in an input query, convert this to a set of pandas operations through an LLM prompt. So actually ask the LLM to generate a set of operations because assuming the LLM is trained over uh, the pandas like documentation and library, it can generate pandas code. You then execute these operations against a data frame. And in Llama Index, the implementation um, actually does this in a relatively safe manner to avoid uh, security vulnerabilities. And then after you get back the results, then you also do response synthesis. You plug in this context and it's informed. So you have a similar stack for text to SQL too. Um, you take in a query, um, do a prompt to convert that query to SQL using both the query as well as the schema of the tables and some sample rows as input. You execute this against a SQL database and then you do response synthesis. So this is a very rough picture of, of what this looks like. Um, there are some differences with the RAG stack, mostly that you have to actually write some sort of symbolic operations to execute against an existing database. And we'll basically show you how to build both a basic to advanced version of uh, QA over tabular data. So if we start with text to pandas, you know, following these steps, a basic workflow would look something like the following. Again, take in the user query, um, input this query and the data frame information into an LLM prompt to generate pandas operations. Then you need to somehow be able to parse these panda operations and run eval on them. You know, again, typically, you know, somewhat of a risky operation, but we'll make it work. And, and then run those uh, run run these operations against a data frame. Uh, once you get back the relevant results you want, then you synthesize the response with the query to get back the final answer. And again, text to SQL looks something similar. You have a query feed it to a text SQL prompt, um, get back SQL, parse it, execute it, and then you get back a response. This is a very basic stack of what text to SQL looks like. Um, if you're building text to SQL in the enterprise, chances are you'll likely have built something more advanced than this. But actually one of the purposes of this video is to show you how to build custom workflows that not only express the basic text to SQL pipeline, but actually more advanced components as well. And so what are some of these more advanced components? An additional step beyond the basic text to SQL stack is to add table retrieval in, into this process. And so what this means is that in a lot of settings, your SQL database often has an entire collection of many different tables. And so many of many times this will actually overflow the, the text to SQL prompt because the text to SQL prompt takes in all the tables within your database and tries to generate a SQL query. Of course, if you have hundreds, thousands of tables, you first need to do some query time retrieval of the relevant tables um, to then put into the prompt and then generate the SQL and get back the answer. This process actually looks very similar to RAG because to do retrieval, uh, we're actually just gonna do standard embedding search, uh, put this into a vector index and get back table objects that you can then put into the text SQL prompt. An additional step beyond that, which we found actually helps performance is row-based retrieval. So actually, once you've found the relevant set of tables, it oftentimes helps to have you know, some sample rows from that table in the prompt as well. Of course, dumping all the rows in the table will overflow the prompt. And one of the issues with just dumping, for instance, like the first five rows or the last five rows is that that's somewhat context unaware, right? It, given a user query, you kind of want the LLM or, or you want this retrieval system to fetch relevant inf data that this query would likely touch just to at least give the LLM a sense of, you know, for instance, the capitalization of different values uh, or the, the format of the dates, for instance. And so having the, these as few shot examples actually helps the text to SQL generation um, operate more robustly so that it's less susceptible to different types of errors. So for instance, you know, if you have a country column, 
Should it be where country equals Japan with a capital J or where country equals uh, J with a lowercase j? This really depends on having some sample values uh, from the table to look at first, because then you can actually get a better sense of what to look at. And of course, you know, we'll be able to visualize this uh, with our query pipeline syntax and also put this into Arise Phoenix uh, for um, observability. And of course, we have a lot of different observability partners. This is just an example to showcase how we integrate by logging all the traces to the downstream observability provider. So let's go through a notebook that shows you actually both text to pandas as well as text to SQL and different stages of text to SQL as well. Um, you can find these guides in the docs right here. So we have a doc on query pipeline over pandas data frames. We also, of course, have an out of the box pandas query engine that you can use if you don't wanna just learn the individual steps. And we also have a query pipeline for advanced text to SQL, which shows you, and we'll go through this to build your own advanced text to SQL stack. And of course, we also have an out of the box text to SQL engine that you can use if you don't wanna worry about the internals. Great, that said, let's transition to our notebook. So here is the notebook, and we are going to show you how to build both text to pandas and text to SQL. And we'll start with text to pandas. So in this example, we'll show you how to build a query pipeline over pandas data frames. Um, this is gonna be a relatively simple example, uh, which will show you how to build a pipeline from scratch to learn how to generate structured operations over a pandas data frame to satisfy a user query, and we'll execute these ops um, and against the data frame and synthesize a response. First, we'll define our imports. As you can see, we import our query pipeline module, um, some additional helper components, and we'll also import this thing called a pandas instruction parser. This is actually a module that given a data frame and a generated instruction string, parses that into operations and runs it in a safe and secure manner. And the data set we're actually just gonna use here is a very basic data set. It's the classic Titanic CSV data set that you can find on Kaggle. I'm pretty sure it's the most popular data set on Kaggle. Um, and then we'll load this in as a data frame. And this is just the information about Titanic passengers, um, different attributes, and whether or not they survived. So now let's define the query pipeline. Let's define the set of modules. Um, the first step is a pandas prompt to infer the pandas instructions from the user query. Um, and that you can see right here. The pandas prompt is you're working with a pandas data frame in Python. The name of the data frame is this. This is what the result of the, you know, the first five rows looks like. Um, and then we insert that as a prompt, uh, as a template string. Um, we also say, please follow these instructions, input the query, and then we await the output. The instruction string here is actually just hard coded. I mean, I think this is, uh, you can customize this instruction string as well. Um, but here, you know, we just tell the LLM to generate a sequence of executable Python code that can be run via eval. Um, GPT 3.5 and 4 are relatively adept at being able to understand this. Here, we're not doing row based retrieval. We're just directly dumping the first five rows in, uh, of the data frame into the prompt, but that's okay. We'll worry about that later. Uh, and besides the pandas prompt, we also have a response synthesis prompt, which, you know, just given the original instructions and the pandas, like the output of the executing pandas operations and the input query, just actually generate a textual response to give back the final answer. So we have, you know, the pandas prompt, the response synthesis prompt, the LLM, and the pandas output parser. Um, this pandas output parser is designed to safely execute Python code. Um, and so it includes a bunch of safety checks that given, again, kind of an input string, will parse out that string into uh, Python um, and check that this Python is relatively safe to uh, execute. It can only import for, from a set of predefined approved modules. So you can't import like .os um, and you also can't uh, access anything other than public methods. So that's what this does. And let's build the query pipeline. Um, the flow should be roughly pretty intuitive, but you take in an input, feed it through the pandas prompt uh, and then the L1, parse it, and then feed it into the response synthesis prompt. So here we just define these modules, um, pandas prompt, 
output parser response synthesis. And here we define the links. Um, it turns out the first half of this can just be represented as a sequential chain from input to prompt to LLM to output parser, and the output is a pandas instructions. Now, the response synthesis prompt, of course, takes in a bunch of stuff. It takes in the original query, um, the LLM output, uh, which is the, the pandas operations, right? This is the pandas instructions, as well as the pandas output. Uh, we link the pandas output parser to response synthesis. So let's execute that. Okay, let's run this again. So we executed that, and then we can try to run the query. And if you hold on for just a bit, I can actually just show you what this looks like. I'm going to copy and paste the visualization code, um, go back into here, and then show you what this looks like. So all I did was we are just going to um, visualize this. You have an input. I'm going to drag this around. Um, and we see that this takes in the input, um, passes it to the pandas prompt, to the LM, generates the instructions, parses it, feeds everything into this response synthesis prompt, which then gives you back the output. OK. So let's run this. Um, if we ask, what is a correlation between survival and age, um, we'll go through all the different modules. right? Um, get to the part where we actually generate the uh, pandas instructions, this thing, um, get back uh, or feed it into the response synthesis prompt, and then get back the final answer. And you can see that this is the final answer. Okay, so that is text to pandas. Now let's go over um, two query pipelines for advanced text to SQL. We'll actually just skip the basic one because um, we already you know, kind of showed it in the slides. And we'll go straight to two components. One is building just a text to SQL pipeline that contains query time table retrieval, where you can dynamically retrieve relevant tables in the text to SQL prompt. And then the next addition to that is to also add query time sample row retrieval, where um, you know, if you embed it and index each row of each table, then when you ask a question over any relevant tables, you can do um, kind of row retrieval to also put that as few shot examples into the text to SQL prompt. The data set we're going to be using is this thing called uh, Wiki Table Questions data set. You know, this came out in 2015, but it's a pretty popular data set for just a table evaluation. Um, none of the tables are actually that big, but you can see that, you know, a lot of times there's just like a lot of different CSV files across a lot of different domains. Um, you know, we're just going through this. This is about towers. This is about, um, actually, this is about cars. This is about population. And they just scraped a bunch of tables from Wikipedia and aggregated it as a data set. And so it's nice because, you know, it's obviously not a complete production setting, but there's a lot of tables and it really stress tests uh, what happens if you try to launch any sort of text to SQL against something with a lot of tables. So let's download this file and unzip it. And let's load all the files in as data frames. Luckily, it, you know, it's not super big. Um, we'll load in everything from the folder called 200-csv. And there's a bunch of files. It's not the entire data set, but it's like a subset of it. Um, you'll see this probably pop up in this uh, folder, but um, we want to create a directory called wiki table questions underscore table info. Um, and this will allow us to not only store the CSVs, which are already downloaded, but actually store metadata uh, for each of the CSVs. Because this, the goal of this section is we want to extract a table name and summary from each of the tables. Um, this will help us better index it for table time retrieval. Um, and this will better help our text to SQL uh, pipeline. So what we do here is we define a pydantic class called table info, which is information regarding a structured table. 
there are two fields. One is table name and table summary. Because there isn't existing metadata attached uh, to each of these CSVs, we're actually just going to have an LLM infer it. You know, we're going to have ChatGPT infer it. The table name must be underscores and no spaces, just for convenience purposes. And um, the table summary is a short, concise summary. And we um, input this prompt, you know, give me a summary of the table with the following JSON format. And the goal is given um, information about a table, uh, we want to output a structured Pydantic object. This is done through a module called a Pydantic program. Um, here it's a form of that, which is using LLMs and prompts. There's also a form that uses OpenAI function calling directly. Um, but really you plug in a few different components. You plug in the output class, the LLM you want to use, and the prompt template string. Um, and then given an input, we'll try to extract out this output. And so this is the prompt string. Um, the input that we expect is the actual table string. And of course, the output that's expected is the table info. So what we're going to do once we define this program, we're just going to go through every single table and then um, try to extract out a summary. Um, we, uh, for the purposes of this video, uh, have basically saved uh, all the table infos already. Um, otherwise, it takes a little bit of time. And you can see this logic here. You know, If the table info already exists, then we're just going to append it. Otherwise, actually run the program um, you know, using LLMs to extract out the summaries. So we have all this stuff. The next step is to, since we're testing text to SQL and we have all these CSVs, um, just put some of this data in a SQL database. And we'll use SQL Alchemy uh, to connect to a simple in-memory SQLite instance. And then put all these CSVs, represent them as tables. Um, and so there's a bunch of code. Uh, we'll link the Colab notebook if you want to dig through it. But roughly speaking, uh, it's just creating a bunch of tables in the SQL database corresponding to the CSVs. And the names of these tables are actually the table infos that we extracted. Okay, and next step is to set up an observability provider. So we, we can actually take a look at the traces. Um, uh, similarly to the previous video, we'll use Arise Phoenix. Again, you can use many of our different observability integrations um, and we'll showcase stuff in just a bit. And as you can see here, the, currently the trace view is blank. So let's first implement text to SQL with query time table retrieval and express that as a set of query pipelines. So we'll show you how to set up an end-to-end -end text to SQL pipeline with table retrieval and define the core modules. Um, one of the first things we'll do is we'll define what we call an object index and retriever to store and index the table schemas. Uh, an object index is just a simple wrapper on top of uh, our popular inde indexes within Llama index, um, such as the vector index, uh, which is backed by a vector store. Um, all an object index does is it translates anything that's stored in an index to an actual object. So instead of just returning text uh, when you retrieve stuff, it actually returns entire objects. Um, this is important because we want to actually store the table schemas and return those as what we call like a SQL table schema object. Um, so therefore, when you get back that object, um, you can directly plug it into your uh, SQL database later on. So we're just defining the object index, the retriever, and the SQL database in this block of code. Um, we just do from llama index import SQL database and define the SQL database based on the SQL Aquamy engine. And to, def to define an uh, object index and retriever, um, you'll see we need a mapping um, on top of the SQL database. And what this does is it um, stores a mapping from the underlying node um, to the expected SQL table schema object. Um, so you can translate stuff back and forth between the node and the object. This is the set of all the objects that we want to index. These are the SQL table schemas. And then we just call object index from objects on the table schema objects, the table node mapping, and the class that we're using under the hood is a simple vector store index. To get a retriever, we just do object retriever equals object index as retriever. Um, so we fetch the top three table schemas every time we run this. Let's try this out. Now that we've defined the object retriever, um, the next step is to define a component 
which given these uh, schemas can, you know, given the set of retrieve schemas can actually just translate it into a string, right? Um, Cause the goal is actually to stuff all these schemas into a prompt. And so this is a simple function that takes in a list of SQL table schemas. And the goal is to output a string. That's just new line separated information um, and each table schema is represented by this piece of text. Here we introduce something that we didn't introduce in the previous video, which is just a function component. This is a very simple component that allows you to define an arbitrary function um, and pass that in. And then this just becomes a component you can plug into the query pipeline. So this is one of the most flexible ways you can, you can compose a query pipeline by just defining functions and stringing them together in the stack. So we defined that table retrieval piece in mapping to context. And so now we can piece together the full uh, text to SQL prompt as well as the output parser. The text to SQL prompt you see here, um, we are going to, let me first run this actually. Okay. The text to SQL prompt, we just import from the default prompts that we use in Lama index. Uh, so, you know, we, we skipped a step in, in terms of actually showing it in the notebook, but this is what it looks like. Um, actually, you can see this in the output over here. Um, given an input question, first create a syntactically correct uh, query to run. Look at the results. You know, here is an example question here: is SQL query to run result of SQL query. Final answer here, and you see the template variables include the table schemas, the query string, and then we await the output SQL query. This template variable is precisely where those retrieve table contacts are going to go, and this is from the input. The only other component we're going to add is after this text to SQL prompt runs, we need to actually um, take the out text and translate it into a SQL query, right? Because um, after this, you know, there could be some messy formatting. Uh, you could, uh, like the LLM sometimes just includes this entire block SQL query. And so we just have some text parsing logic that looks at the response and tries to specifically uh, fetch the SQL statement that immediately follows this line. Um, and this is another function component. It's called a SQL parser component. So let's run this again. And finally, we have a response synthesis prompt, which given the input query, the SQL statement and the SQL response um, generates the final textual response. So this just gives you back the final answer. Now we can define the query pipeline, right? So now the components are in place, let's define the query pipeline. And um, this looks like a decent number of components, but it should be pretty intuitive. Uh, we first have the input with the input component. We then want to run table retrieval and table output parsing to extract out that table context string from relevant tables. We then have the text SQL prompt that's, uh, you know, we, we load the table string into as well as the L1. We want to parse the SQL and, you know, do retrieval from it, uh, from, from the SQL database. And then after getting back the result, we want to do response synthesis. So let's run this um, and we can express these as links, basically according to what I just talked about. Um, I can explain these links, but it's actually just nice to visualize what happens after we we uh, run this. And this is a more visual example of all of relationships I described. You have this input. The next step is table retrieval, table output parsing. This plus the input goes in the text to SQL prompt, which then goes through the LLM, parses out the SQL right here. And this um, uh, goes into the SQL database to retrieve the relevant tables. This goes into the response synthesis prompt along with the SQL and input and gives you back the final answer. So you can express this entire workflow as a DAG and that's exactly what we did. Now let's run some queries. We're gonna ask what was the year that the Notorious BIG was signed to Bad Boy? This is information that is specifically within a single table out of this collection of a few dozen tables that we input into the SQLite database. And so let's see, given this entire pipeline, if it can find it. The input, um, we run through you know, table retrieval. Hopefully, we find the right table. Hopefully, we go through a text to SQL prompt, LLM, 
output parser, blah, blah, blah. And then we get back this response. The Notorious B.I.G. was signed to Bad Boy in 1993. If we click back into um, the Phoenix trace view, um, you can actually see this entire trace in action. Um, so if we click into this query, you know, what was the year that Notorious B.I.G. was signed to Bad Boy? You see that we first launched this, this first retrieval call is against the table retriever, and it's getting back two tables, uh, one of which is actually relevant and the other one of which is not. So first, the first schema is bad boy artist, which is exactly the thing that we're looking for. You know, it contains, you know, the year assigned, you know, that, that's the column we're looking for, as well as the uh, artist. And then the second table is Renaissance discography, which is not relevant, but that's okay. That's just because we, we set the top k equals to two. And so this is what the text to SQL prompt looks like. Um, you know, give an input question, and when we say only use tables listed below, we injected the table context into the prompt. And so given the question, we output the SQL query. This next retrieve call just runs the SQL statement against the DB and gives you back the relevant context, right? And so this retriever really is just running SQL statement and giving back a set of context nodes. And then finally, this last LLM call is a response synthesis. So given an input question, synthesize a response from the query results. The query is, what was the year that the notorious BIG was signed to bad boy? You have the SQL statement, SQL response, and then finally, you have 1993. OK, so that was step one in being able to run an advanced text to SQL pipeline, and we had table retrieval baked in. So that's already a decent start, but actually, you know, the last part of this video uh, takes this uh, even one step further. And this is in the second advanced capability, which is text to SQL with both table time retrieval as well as query time row retrieval. Um, one issue in the previous example is that if the user asks a query that say asks for something like the notorious BIG without the periods, but the artist is stored as the notorious BIG, the generated select statement is not gonna return any matches. Because if you go back into this Phoenix trace view, you see the generated SQL statement is where act equals the notorious b.i.g. But if you ask, you know, what would remove the periods, it would also remove the periods in the generated SQL, and then you would get back nothing. So how do we actually uh, prevent that? How do we make this a little bit more robust? And that's where the example, that's where the few shot row examples come into play. Um, we can alleviate this problem by fetching a small number of example rows uh, per table. And instead of just taking the top few rows, we actually try to fetch rows, embed, index, and retrieve the rows that are relevant to the query. So you're not getting back stuff from random artists, you're getting back specifically stuff around um, you know, the notorious BIG. So let's build this. Um, we extend the query pipeline, we'll redefine it and, and add some more stuff. Um, and actually just for various purposes, um, we'll kind of, we'll define this query pipeline in the beginning and we can always add modules to it. The main reason is so that we can um, pass through the, the query pipelines callback manager um, to all downstream modules, um, which allows us to um, uh, look at the comprehensive trace throughout this entire system. Um, note that the service context object, this thing we're defining here, is deprecated uh, in, in a V10 release coming out soon. And so afterwards, you just won't need this part at all, and you just need to pass QP.callback manager to all downstream modules. But for the sake of this video, uh, we'll have this for now. So let's run this. And what we're going to do to prep for this is that for each table, we are going to store that actually not only in the SQL database, but actually as a vector index. And we're going to embed and index every single row of each table. Um, and you can see this code over here. Um, this function just indexes all the tables. And we see this vector index dictionary. It's a mapping from the table name to the index, the vector index corresponding to that table. Um, and each row is just represented as a string of text, right? And this, of course, like it, it, the, the goal really is to just give you um, some sort of embedding representation of each row that you can use dense retrieval for um, to actually you know, put into the text to SQL prompt. Um, this entire logic just does indexing. Right, um, for each uh, table. 
and it will persist it if, uh, like or build it and persist it if it doesn't exist or load from an existing storage system. So let's run this, and you can see you know it's indexing rows in all of these tables. And as an example, let's take um, Bad Boy Artists as Retriever. So for this table, you know we index all the rows in this table. Um, and let's take a look at you know what, what happens if we just put an artist name. What, what do we get outside? We put in p.diddy, and you see the artist is stored in the table as just Diddy, right, with the year of 1993. So this is good. If we can do this for you know any of the queries we want to run, this means that we can input stuff that's not does not syntactically match, but uh, we can still get back the the examples, the actual examples, to therefore craft a better SQL statement. So to plug this component in, we just want to define an expanded table parser. Um, this table parser is responsible for, again, taking in the set of table schema objects and translating it into context. And so we just want to expand this function um, to not only convert the table schema itself to a string, uh, as with the previous example, but also run retrieval on the index corresponding to that table to look up some relevant rows and insert those rows into the context too. So this is the table info, right? for the given table. Um, this is just the table context. But also for the table, we'll look up the vector index for that table to return relevant table rows. Um, and we'll inject it here. Like here are some relevant example rows for that given table. So the each table will contain both a context string as well as the row string. And we'll wrap this as before in a function component. Um, so Given, again, the set of retrieved table schemas and queries, we'll get back the table and row per table context. We just ran that. And now let's define this expanded query pipeline. Um, I actually won't spend as much time here um, as before because this is actually literally the exact same pipeline as the previous one. Um, the main difference is the table parser component um, now just has a different function underneath it, but we have actually the same set of nodes and links. So let's run this. Visualize this. This is actually the exact same as what we just showed before. Right? Input retrieval, parsing, text to SQL, LM. SQL retrieval, response synthesis. And now let's run some queries. And let's run what was the year that the notorious BIG was signed to Bad Boy, but without the periods. We run through this entire module, and somewhere in this area of generating text to SQL, um, you'll see that, and, and we'll see this in, in more detail uh, in the trace view, that it's actually generating the correct SQL statement, right? It is actually inserting the valid value um, instead of just using the input that we provided. And of course, we get back the right results. If we take a look at the trace view for what's going on and click into this query, now we see there's three retrieval calls. Um, the first step is table retrieval. So given the, the input, we want to return the relevant tables from the SQL database. And so here we return the schemas, um, bad boy artists. And also here it's football team records, which is a totally irrelevant table, but again, doesn't really matter. The next retrieval call, actually the next two retrieval calls, um, go into each table and return relevant rows for each table. Um, and this is exactly where we see that when we fetch the notorious BIG, we get back two example rows, uh, one of which is Diddy, right, which is irrelevant, but the second is actually just the example row, like the value um, showing the correct entry with 1993 and 5. Um, the second retrieval call is irrelevant because it's uh, it fetching rows from an irrelevant table. But then we call a text to SQL. Um, and this is the expanded text to SQL prompt, where you know you not only see the table schemas, but you also see some relevant example rows. And given all this information, you then try to generate the SQL query. Uh, and the next steps are standard. You do SQL retrieval against a DB. And then finally, response synthesis.
So that's all the sections we wanted to show you today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, thanks, and leave your comments in the in the comment section below. Okay.